The Wayans brothers were a fixture of TV and movies for decades. Keenan Ivory Wayans created and starred in Fox's sketch comedy series In Living Color, and so did his siblings Damon, Kim, Sean, and Marlon. When that series concluded, Keenan turned to directing Scary Movie and other hits, while Damon Wayans starred on TV shows such as My Wife and Kids. Sean and Marlon became a successful film comedy duo, who most will remember best for starring in White Chicks and Little Man. But while there was a time when TV and film fans couldn't go a week without coming across a member of the Wayans family, we just don't see or hear as much from this brood as we used to. From crazy career moves and failed projects to off-color opinions and new priorities, here are a few reasons why Hollywood seemingly won't cast the Wayans brothers anymore. Despite being massively popular and introducing much of the world to the Wayans family and Jim Carrey, In Living Color doesn't get the respect afforded to other classic sketch comedy shows, such as Saturday Night Live. Rapper Cardi B sought to right that injustice with the video for Finesse, an early 90s-esque collaboration with Bruno Mars. The clip faithfully recreates memorable moments from ILC, including its paint-splattering opening sequence and show-closing live musical performances. Some Wayans family members saw the music video, and they reportedly approved it. Damon Wayans called it dope. Marlon Wayans said it was dope as F. And Kim Wayans thought it was an amazing tribute that made her get emotional. Before getting to understand why the Wayans were blackballed, it would be important to understand the family tree, how they rose to fame, and the individual role of each family member. When looking at the Wayans family tree showcases a long line of talented actors and artists, like other legacy families within the entertainment industry, such as the Coppolas and the Barrymores, the Wayans are an extensive family in which most members have been actively involved in Hollywood. Whether as an actor, a comedian, a director, or a screenwriter, each of the most famous and well-known members of the Wayans family has had their hand in the art and business of entertainment, and together they have contributed to several iconic movies and TV shows. For example, the Wyans family has created TV shows like In Living Color and the Wyans Brothers, and movies such as Little Man, the scary movie franchise, and White Chicks, which may get a sequel. Additionally, outside the projects they've created, the Wayans have also been prominently featured in various other films and series. Ranging from big-budget action movies to popular mainstream sitcoms to even small arthouse indie films, the Wayans family has consistently proven to have not just a lot of talent, but range as well. Howell and Elvira are, respectively, the former patriarch and matriarch of the Wayans family. Unlike most of the other members of the Wayans family, Howell and Elvira Wayans have no personal connection with Hollywood. Instead, Howell Wayans was the manager of a supermarket, and Elvira Wayans was a social worker. Sadly, both Howell and Elvira Wayans have passed away, with Elvira in 2020, and Howell in 2023. The eldest son in the Wayans family is Keenan Ivory Wayans. Keenan is best known for creating, writing, and directing some of the most iconic movies and shows associated with the Wayans family. For example, he wrote, created, and starred in the predominantly black sketch comedy series In Living Color, which featured many Wayans siblings, as well as other actors that would later become famous, like Tommy Davidson, David Allen Greer, Takiya Crystal Kima, and Bruce Almighty star Jim Carrey. Wayans also directed features like the first two scary movie films, White Chicks, Little Man, I'm Gonna Get You Sucka, and A Low Down Dirty Shame. Then there is Damon Wayans, Sr. The senior Damon is best known for writing and creating various movies and TV shows in which he also stars. For example, within the world of film, Wayans Sr. both wrote and appeared in Major Payne as Major Benson Winifred Payne, Blankman as the titular superhero whose alter ego is Daryl Walker, and Mo Money as Johnny Stewart. Additionally, Wayans Sr. also created, wrote, and played the lead character in various TV shows, most notably Damon as Damon Thomas and My Wife and Kids as Michael Kyle. He is also best known for playing Roger Murtaugh in the cancelled Lethal Weapon series. Then comes Damon Wayans Jr., Damon Wayans Jr. has found great success within the world of TV as he is best known for his roles as Brad Williams in the sitcom Happy Endings and coach in Elizabeth Merriweather's beloved sitcom New Girl. Additionally, 
Outside of playing these characters, Wayans Jr. has also appeared in guest roles for various critically acclaimed sitcoms like Brooklyn Nine-Nine as Detective Stevie Shillins, Curb Your Enthusiasm as a Police Officer, and Bob's Burgers as Arnold. In the film, Wayans Jr. has been featured in Let's Be Cops as Justin Miller, Big Hero 6 as Wasabi, and Super Troopers 2 as Trooper Wagner. Next up is Elvira Alethea Wayans. Unlike the other members of the Wayans family, Elvira Alethea Wayans has not only lived a private life but also appeared to have removed herself from Hollywood altogether. Wayans' only IMDb credits are as a writer and assistant to writers for her brother Damon's show My Wife and Kids, along with a thank you credit from her brother Marlon for The Curse of Bridge Hollow. However, Elvira does have two kids who are active in Hollywood, Damien Dante and Shante Wayans. The son of Elvira, Damien Dante Wayans, first began his career as an actor by playing small roles in various Wayans family projects like In Living Color, Major Pain, and Don't Be a Menace to South Central While Drinking Your Juice in the Hood. He secured his first major acting role when he played Tech in the film Malibu's Most Wanted. Outside of acting, Wayans has also served as a writer and director in various other creative projects, most notably Damon Wayans' My Wife and Kids, and the film Dance Flick, which was his directorial debut. And then there is Kim Wayans. Kim has proven to be a very versatile actress, as she has given terrific performances in comedies like In Living Color, Don't Be a Menace to South Central While Drinking Your Juice in the Hood, and Dance Flick, while also showcasing her dramatic talent in movies and shows like Pariah as Audrey, Hawaii Five Zero as Diane, and Criminal Minds as Darlene Beckett. Kim is also a screenwriter, as she wrote several episodes for My Wife and Kids. Her brother, Sean Wayans, is quite a familiar face for sure. Sean is best known for co-creating and starring in the sitcom The Wayans Brothers, in which he starred alongside his brother Marlon Wayans, as well as other actors and comedians like John Witherspoon and Anna Maria Horsford. Sean also co-wrote the screenplays for the first two scary movie films with Marlon, as well as playing the character Ray Wilkins in both movies. He also co-wrote and had starring roles in other Wayans family productions like White Chicks as Kevin Copeland, Little Man as Daryl Edwards, and Don't Be a Menace to South Central While Drinking Your Juice in the Hood as Ashtray. Then comes the funny Marlon Wayans. Marlon is best known for co-creating, co-writing, and co-starring many Wayans family-produced projects like The Wayans Bros as Marlon Williams, the first two scary movie films as Shorty Meeks, White Chicks as Marcus Copeland, and Little Man as Clavin Babyface Sims. Additionally, outside these entertaining comedies that involve the Wayans family tree, Marlon has also had the opportunity to work with several critically acclaimed directors. He has appeared in films like Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream as Tyrone C. Love, the Coen brothers' The Lady Killers as Gawain McSam, Sofia Coppola's On the Rocks as Dean, and Ben Affleck's Air as George Raveling. Now that we know all the weigh-ins in Hollywood, it will now be easy to see how some gatekeepers have been working hard to keep them away from realizing their full potential. First things first, have you ever wondered why Scary Movie 1 and 2 were great and the rest were just disappointing? Well, that's because the Wayans brothers did a fantastic job with the script and the plot, but then Hollywood gatekeepers came and messed it up. The Wayans are like the Jacksons of comedy. Movies like Little Man, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, and White Chicks are cult classics. But nothing quite hits the spot like Scary Movie 1 and 2. The Scary Movie franchise reinvented the horror comedy genre. Instead of just mixing scares with jokes, it went all in on making fun cracking jokes non-stop. The writing was new and brought a breath of fresh air to funny spoof films. It was cheeky and hilarious. It didn't even try to be polite or politically correct. And the people loved it. Originally, Scary Movie was a family affair. It was directed by Keenan Ivory Wayans and starred the brothers Marlon and Sean, who co-wrote the movies. But by the time the third movie came, they were out. Hollywood stole Scary Movie from the Wayans. Yes, you heard that right. Here is what really happened behind the scenes. In 2000, Scary Movie 1 was a game changer when it came to genre melding. It's a straight up comedy satire that makes fun of horror movies. It gave viewers a clear perspective of how stupid actual horror films sometimes can be and made fun of them as much as possible. In 2019, 
Forbes placed Scary Movie on its list of the 25 highest grossing horror movies ever. The outlet reported that its lifetime domestic gross was anywhere from $159 million to $262.5 million at that time. After the first two films, the Wayans brothers were no longer heavily involved with the franchise when the third installment rolled around because Marlon claims it was swiftly snatched by the Weinstein Company. The Weinstein Company gave the franchise a shot after it was rejected by other production studios, Variety reports. However, when it was time for the third installment, Marlon had his account of what happened with the deal. We didn't walk away from a franchise. They didn't want to make our deal and they snatched it. Marlon Wayans explained during a conversation with Kevin Hart on the Comedy Gold Mines podcast. We never walked away from our franchise that we created. It was taken, and us being the creatives that we are, we're like, all right, bet. He continued, now watch what I create. Making matters worse, the Wayans didn't hear they would no longer be involved in the third installment of their franchise directly. Instead, it was brought to their attention after it was shared by a publication around the holidays. The second one they rushed us into, and by the third one, they didn't want to pay the money, so they snatched it. We found out on Christmas that they hired somebody else to go do it, Wayans told Hart. The third installment was brought to the screens by Dimension Films, a division that was under the Weinstein Company, and the Wayans brothers' involvement was reduced to writing credits. The Wayans brothers were asked to return for the fifth film. However, the opportunity was turned down because they had their time and did what they could with the franchise, according to Looper. Marlon also said that his family may one day follow through with a lawsuit against the Weinstein Company. We probably should sue for hundreds of millions of dollars because they probably owe us, Marlon said on the podcast episode. He continued, and maybe one day we will but we didn't walk away from our franchise. In 2018, the Weinstein Company reportedly filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Then, in 2021, the company was approved to start the process of a liquidation plan by a U.S. bankruptcy court judge, according to Deadline. Based on these findings, only time will tell if the Wyans brothers will get the money Marlin claims they are owed. But that's not the only tragedy the Wayans have gone through at the hands of heartless Hollywood execs. As earlier mentioned, audiences were introduced to Wayans in the early 90s after In Living Color debuted on the nascent Fox network, delivering an edgier, multicultural alternative to SNL. It ushered in a slew of new talent, including five of the Wayans siblings, Keenan, Damon, Kim, Sean, and Marlon, as well as Jim Carrey and Jamie Foxx. In 1995, Marlon and Sean set off on their own, creating the Wayans Brothers for the WB It's Opening, in which they're wearing J. Crew-worthy sweaters and crooning, We're brothers, we're happy, and we're singing, and we're colored, took aim at more decorous black sitcoms and their dance-filled opening credits. The NAACP and self-appointed black respectability arbiter Bill Cosby criticized the show for its humorous portrayal of black characters. Every artist deserves to have their own particular voice, Marlon says. I'm not Cosby. We were raised in the projects in New York City. I was collecting bottles and cans at seven and eight years old. I had my first job at 11 and never stopped working. Despite being a ratings hit, The Wyans Brothers was canceled without a true series finale. But with the current vogue for Black 90s nostalgia, fueled in part by Netflix's acquisition of shows like Sister, Sister, and Moesha, Marlon is mulling a Wyans Brothers movie so the show can have a proper ending, perhaps in conjunction with a streaming debut. Comedy is a genre that's subject to evolving standards and tastes. Black humor created under the auspices of white Hollywood networks and studios, for instance, can be seen now as a discomforting time capsule of racial stereotypes. Marlon is aware that future audiences could deride his comedic contributions. One day people are going to look back on all the things that we did and go, oh, that's degrading, and that's not fair, he says. We should embrace all of our history and we get better over time. He's also aware that critics prefer his dramatic turns, and Marlon, an alum of New York's prestigious LaGuardia Performing Arts School, is eager to show his range. I played everything from a junkie to an abusive husband to a loving husband to a white woman, he says. At this point, 
I've done so much that I hope I don't have to prove myself anymore. The struggle of black actors in Hollywood has been going on for decades, and even though much has been achieved, there is still much more to be done. When The Birth of a Nation was released in 1915, it marked the beginning of a century of deeply racist and damaging representations of black people on film. While The Birth of a Nation was heralded as a cinematic masterpiece, and is still regarded to this day as one of the most technologically advanced and sophisticated films of the era. At the time of its release, black groups openly criticized and protested it. They organized, they pleaded with censor boards to ban the film, and there were riots. From Hollywood's beginnings, black people were mostly given roles as subservient maids, butlers, slaves, and sharecroppers in movies with regressive racist messages. But over the last century, there have also been movements, from the Harlem Renaissance to the L.A. Rebellion, to present black people as real, nuanced human beings with stories worth telling on film. In the 1920s, the influential revival of black arts and culture, later known as the Harlem Renaissance, was in full swing. Civil rights groups like the National Urban League, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the NAACP were gaining prominence. Meanwhile, black cinema was being advanced by directors like Oscar Michaud. The son of former slaves, Michaud made 45 movies over his career and was called the Jackie Robinson of the film world. Instead of presenting typical Hollywood images of black people as slaves, maids, and butlers, Michaud told stories that featured black teachers, ministers, and lawyers. His 1920 silent film Within Our Gates, the oldest known surviving feature film made by an African-American director, told the story of a sharecropper and his wife being cheated out of pay by their white boss. Then, in 1929, MGM produced Hallelujah, the first Hollywood film with sound to feature an all-black cast. However, it was helmed by a white Texan filmmaker named King Vidor, who reflected not only typical Southern attitudes of the day, but also the so-called race science of 1920s America. Upon its release, white critics loved the film, but reactions among black audiences were divided. Some praised the film, but other commentators and cultural critics were ultimately disappointed by its messages. In the 1930s, once the novel Gone with the Wind was optioned to be made into a film, the NAACP started pressuring MGM not to make it because they were fearful that it would just be a repeat of The Birth of a Nation. Nevertheless, MGM and studio executive David O. Selznick began making the film while assuring the NAACP that they would make a better version of Gone with the Wind than the book. The character played by black actor Hattie McDaniel was an example of one black caricature permeating cinema at the time. The Maid. McDaniel's portrayal of Mammy garnered a mixed response, in some black circles, she was accused of playing an Uncle Tom. Other movie fans and critics, both white and black, called aspects of her performance powerful or even masterful. In 1940, McDaniel took home an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress, making her the first black person to win an Oscar. When the Second World War began, Hollywood produced feature films appealing to black people to get behind the war. In We've Come a Long, Long Way by white producer Jack Goldberg, black people were warned that Hitler would outlaw the NAACP and suppress black entertainers. In response, the NAACP launched a campaign against the film, calling it propaganda. However, there was also a belief in the black community that fighting Hitler on behalf of America would help speed up the fight for their own rights. Post-war Hollywood provided a new set of disappointments for black people, according to observers. They scrambled for fewer and fewer roles, almost disappearing from the screen. Hollywood also started to make more films for and about white women, like Mildred Pierce, starring Joan Crawford. Some critics wondered whether Hollywood was deliberately focusing on narratives of white women to avoid controversy over how black people were being portrayed. The period from 1946 to 1950 marked a brief and curious moment in Hollywood's history, an attempt to explore racism and anti-Semitism through the passing genre, with whites trying to come to grips with the other. Hollywood promoted what it called Negro Tolerance Movies, featuring light-skinned black people who were framed as interlopers who could pass 
and enjoy white privilege while exposing racism. In the 1949 film Lost Boundaries, a black doctor and his family end up in a small town in New Hampshire where they take him to be white. During the 60s, as the fight for black civil rights was raging in America, Hollywood mostly stayed away. Buildings were being burned, political leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr. were being assassinated, and protests and uprisings were sweeping through the streets. But representations of this massive change were absent from the screens. The 1967 film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, starring Sidney Poitier, tells the story of a young white woman who brings her black fiancé home to meet her parents. It was seen as a very liberal film at the time. When it arrived on the cinematic scene in 1970, the black exploitation genre began showing powerful images of black people who were unapologetically angry, often violent, sometimes even pursuing a goal to K. Whitey. Hundreds of movies were made during the five years that defined the black exploitation era, featuring gorgeous soundtracks, evocative clothing, and some believed dangerous imagery. While black characters started to be presented with more humanity and depth following World War II, it wasn't until black exploitation arrived that the early film caricatures of subservient maids and butlers were turned completely on their heads. Now, black characters were often portrayed as criminals, bent on revenge, against each other, but more often against white people. In response to black exploitation films and classic Hollywood cinema, a group of young independent filmmakers who trained at the UCLA Film School began to form the LA Rebellion film movement. Some were Black Panthers, others were not. Many borrowed from liberation struggles in the developing world. Some wanted to reform Hollywood. By the 1980s, a unique era of black cinema had come to an end. The NAACP had kept up its pressure on Hollywood to abandon black exploitation, while the LA Rebellion movement languished without the backing of a powerful infrastructure. Although some LA Rebellion and black exploitation filmmakers continued working, a moment in cultural history had passed. A bigger change was also sweeping through Hollywood. The film industry was restructuring and entering the era of the blockbuster, and it was swallowing up independent film. Then, in 1989, a $6 million film about racial injustice blasted into popular culture, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, which reflected a nuanced and loving portrait of a black community. To this day, Do the Right Thing is considered a landmark film, prescient in its narrative of black America. Fast forward to 2015, when Academy Award nominations were announced, a public identity crisis was triggered for Hollywood. That year, only two people of color were nominated in major categories. In response, activist April Rain created the social media hashtag hash OscarsSoWhite to call out the lack of diversity in the awards, as well as the lack of diversity in Hollywood in general. Things slightly changed, but in reality, racial inequality is still a thorn in the flesh of many Hollywood actors. Recently, established actors like Taraji P. Henson, Monique, and Terrence Howard have all publicly decried the lack of equality in Hollywood. Will the weigh-ins be the end to this injustice? Only time will tell. And that's it from us today. Until next time, thank you for watching.